Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order the Health and Human Services in a committee. I was about to say appointments and equity. <laughs> oh, habits die hard. Ah, so can we have a roll call, please? Calling the roll, Ms. Conwell? Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Ms. Baker? Here. Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller is absent at the moment. There is a quorum. I'd like to excuse Mr. Miller, even though we don't need to for committee. Um, due to the holiday that has kind of set the county schedule um, forwards and backwards a little bit, so we are meeting on a off um, date and time. And so Mr. Miller had um, other obligations. He's the chair of an off-site board, so I would like to excuse him. Is there a second? A second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Anyone signed in for public comment related to the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, Reverend Pinkney? Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. And thank you for what you did, Councilwoman. I know you, I know your hand was in on that. Thank you for what you did for me yesterday. I appreciate it. Um, just call it Moms Bind Together. <laughs> Um, for resolution uh, 221, the uh, Maximus uh, Human Services uh, resolution for work experience program, I'm not certain if it's also in conjunction with the county welfare department, but the uh, work, uh, SNAP to work program or uh, that program, it's only for people 50 and under. So people who have uh, challenges or who are trying to get reestablished and get employment, the welfare department does not give opportunities to people who are over the age of 50 for employment through their program. So will you please look into that and see if there are some other options available through that program? For the um, Resolution 222, the United Way of Greater Cleveland, um, something needs to be done with that uh, phone process because I know from personal experience, I have not gotten any assistance on it, 211. And it's not because somebody's doing something to me. It's just so uh, discombobulated that the resources, they need some assistance in that area to show what is really available. Um, and I've been going to them for several years now, so I'm sure other people are. And someone needs to actually go on that phone system. You're on hold for 20 minutes almost each time that you do call. And I don't want your funding to stop because the people do need their assistance. Um, for the Catholic Charities Foundation, I want to uh, tell you and applaud you for working with them uh, and getting the community resources that they do because uh, uh, the people who need the birth certificates for their children and others, that is still a, a very amenable resource as well as the legal aid clinic, which still needs some support from the council because the uh, legal aid society is not getting the uh, necessary resources it has to have to function properly with Catholic charities as well as the other church community. Uh, for the Centers of Families and Children, it is not clear that that agency is a mental health agency. And when people go there, people are believing that they're actually functioning and focusing on the family when the only goal is to get people medicated with psychotropic medications. That's not appropriate because people have other needs uh, other than that and it's not assumed that when a person comes to the government that there's something wrong with their minds because there's nothing wrong with the people in the government's minds. The government is established uh, to work in conjunction with the faith community for the wholeness of the family. And I'm gonna come back with, um, and I wanna say uh, thank you to Elaine Gimmel, the CEO for Eden Incorporation, for getting on top of my concerns I brought to you all in the past. I see she's in the room and I've also told her that she has some assistance that she needs from me to let me know for other people. Uh, I'm coming back for non-agenda items to share some more information with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we will move. Any other public comment? No, Madam Chair. All right. Approval of the minutes from the November 1st, 2017 meeting. So can I have a motion and a second? Second. Motion. Motion and a second by Mr. Tuma there. He had a long committee, so he's a little <laughs> rattled today. <laughs> So uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Minutes have been approved. We have several items uh, referred to the committee today. We will. Uh, we had one pending, which is R2017-0165 that was left in committee. 
And so if, uh, Madam Clerk, if you will read that into the record, please. Resolution number 2017-0165, authorizing an amendment to contract number CE-170015 with Case Western Reserve University for fiscal agent services in connection with First Year Cleveland Initiative for the period 6-1-2016 through 4-30-2019 to expand the scope of services effective 4-1-2017 and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $1,500,000. Thank you. Oh, look up. Good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Director Kerrigan and uh, Matt Carroll. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, Ms. Kerrigan's here again today. She would be happy to answer any additional questions. I think the committee's received a little bit of extra information. Um, we, at this point, uh, would, again, be happy to go into any other detail that you would like. Okay, I only had one lingering question, and you know we have to do our due diligence at, at this committee or be given the information up front. Um, so, Director, we had spoken on the phone in regards to there's a lot of components to this infant mortality and a lot of questions uh, because there's a lot of players um, to tackle um, this problem. So there is a component in regards to um, faith-based and so um, I had a question in terms of how that is looked upon uh, of working and uh, is it a, the best practice? Um, you know, the community deserves to know why we have all these intricate um, things going on. So Director Kerrigan gave me a long-winded answer. And so I said, oh, well, let, I'll re-ask that and let her respond again. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and to the rest of the council. Yes, faith-based, actually, you're going to hear the governor speak next week on faith-based playing a key role in safe sleep. Um, we talked last time that we lost 21 babies last year from preventable sleep-related deaths. We feel the faith-based can play a huge role in supporting the messages that we are giving our expected mothers and fathers during prenatal care and the birth about alone on the back in a crib, don't smoke. And what we're finding is out of those 21 deaths you heard about that we spoke um, and did a deep dive about a month ago, those were preventable and each of those families were aware of the ABCDs, but they um, did not follow them. There is some literature and best practices around the country of having faith-based um, encourage and coordinate and align with the hospitals on that same message to change behavior year because of the trusted relationship. So you will hear the governor come out next week applauding Cuyahoga County, who just kicked off 44 health faith-based ambassadors to support safe sleep and to shoot for the goal of having no baby die with preventable sleep-related death. So this is a best practice that has been used in Baltimore, Cradle, Cincinnati, and we're thrilled to partner with you of launching it just recently. Any questions for the committee in terms of that? Any other questions in terms of this uh, piece of legislation? All right, hearing none, and I know this is probably definitely a second reading suspension, so I'd like to open that up uh, for a motion for second reading suspension. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next item, please. Resolution number 2017-0218, making an award on requisition number 40092 to Emerald Development and Economic Network in the amount not to exceed $716,955 for the rapid rehousing program for homeless individuals and families. All right. Before you, um, good afternoon, Director Gillette. Um, I asked her several questions, and she was so kindly to... Uh, restate them on the handout that she gave. So I won't have any questions in terms of, or maybe, but uh, I don't foresee having any questions um, uh, from this. Uh, we'll open it up to committee after um, Director Gillette lets us know what this contract is for. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, um, Madam Chair and Council Committee members. Um, I'm here to ask your approval of a contract being awarded through an RFP process to Emerald Development and Economic Network in the amount not to exceed $716,955. Uh, 
Um, I apologize that I thought the questions were really from the whole committee, and uh, I didn't see them until shortly before the meeting. But they were actually really good questions. And um, so, for example, I'm just going to use them as my talking points, if that's okay with that's you. That's fine. Um, the rapid rehousing program uh, uh, served by this contract provides short-term rent subsidies for homeless, families, youth, and single adults. Um, this particular contract uh, is, uh, through this contract, all three subpopulations can be served, and uh, the uh, total grant amount, contract amount, is broken out between rent assistance to the households, uh, support services, which includes uh, case management while the household is receiving rapid rehousing, a small amount of money for HMIS because there's uh, data entry requirements, and then uh, less than 10% admin, which is allowed through the federal program. Um, there were some questions about how did Eden become the uh, provider for these services, so there's quite a bit of explanation of the fact that um, when our community was first awarded funding through rapid rehousing, it was 2010, and the Office of Homeless Services did an RFP process that ended up identifying Eden. Uh, once again, in 2012, uh, that we did an additional RFP process, and again, Eden was uh, identified. Um, at the time that, so this funding stream is coming through the continuum of care, which is a different funding stream. Um, when we submitted the application, we identified Eden as the sub-recipient for several reasons. One was to strengthen our application because we were identifying a strong partner. Um, uh, see, what were the other reasons? I know they had some. Um, at any rate, uh, they, they definitely had the capacity and had been providing the services uh, before. Um, and thirdly, within the time frame of submitting the NOFA, uh, we were not able to conduct an RFP. So the Office of Homeless Services included them as the identified provider with the um, acknowledgement that we would then do an RFP if the grant were awarded. So we have done the RFP in 2017. Uh, Eden was the only bidder. Um, uh, and they, in addition to being the only bidder, they, they, they definitely are qualified to provide the service. Um, one of the attachments includes a distribution of, you know, some data about uh, <clears throat> the number of households that have been assisted since January 2017, broken out by uh, the, the subpopulation of families, singles, and young families, and young singles. Um, these numbers actually reflect all the households that are being assisted in our community, not just with this contract, but with other funding that's targeted to rapid rehousing. Um, this particular contract has funding to serve 175 households. And uh, I can ask Eden for an update on how many have been served to date through the, uh, through the previous contract. Um, so I'm trying to think if there was, I've also attached for your information the scope of services, which really details the activities that are provided, which include housing inspections, um, issuing the, the, the checks, uh, providing case management through subcontracts with other providers in the community, uh, verifying eligibility, tracking outcomes, all those kinds of things. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Elaine Gimmel is here. She's uh, the Chief Operating Officer for Eden. If uh, that, there are other questions that the committee has. Any questions for the committee? Councilwoman Brown. I see um, on the uh, advisory board meeting page there were some extensions. Um, what is the typical 
uh, supplement time frame? Is it a month? Is it quarterly? A year? What What is the intention of the funds? How are they used to supplement? In what time frame? Through the chair to Councilman Brown, the a length of subsidy it varies by the subpopulation. So families receive um, a security deposit plus four months of rent with the possibility of an extension if needed. Uh, single adults, uh, it's a security deposit up to two months of rent. And then for youth, um, it's a security deposit, and I believe it's up to four months, but again, with the option for extensions. And um, the uh, security deposit, two-month rent for this for singles, and then four month for youth. What's the cutoff for youth? The uh, let, uh, four off. months. No cutoff age. I'm sorry, oh, I wasn't. Twenty four. Eighteen to twenty four. Eighteen mm -hmm. to twenty four. And then, um, as far as extensions, that is there a number of extensions and limits and extensions that can be offered, and are they monthly or <clears throat> quarterly? So the whole uh, goal of rapid rehousing is to get people back into housing but to then not have them return to homelessness. And so um, the extensions are intended to help um, stabilize the, the household as necessary. So it's really an individualized sort of uh, determination, um, again, to prevent that household from coming back into shelter. Um, in general, if it appears that someone uh, you know, requires an extension and then may require further extension, then we begin to look for a permanent uh, supportive housing subsidy because that would indicate that like a short-term subsidy is not really gonna solve this individual's, you know, they're not gonna be able to maintain. So then we would just use the rapid rehousing to bridge that household until we have you know, through other resources, um, a long-term subsidy. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilwoman Baker. Thank you. Uh, thank you for what you do. I, I guess I would ask that before the short-term rent subsidy begins, are they coming, for the most part, from a shelter, which is also short-term? Uh, through the chair to Councilwoman Baker, Yes, the eligibility for receiving rapid rehousing is that you are literally homeless. So that means you are residing in a shelter or in a place unfit for human habitation, in which case we would try to place you in a shelter while you know, getting rapid rehousing takes um, a minute or more. So um, yes, it's targeted to literally homeless individuals and families. I may continue, and if I heard uh, what you said, they are um, typically in those homes for families, for example, was it nine months? Let's see, families, nine months of assistance. Is that what uh, rapid housing, um, for the most part, is it an anticipation of, of nine months, or is that that's the longest extension? Oh, through the Chair to Councilman um, Baker, at the bottom of the page, uh, that is that is unusual. So that's, unusual. The, that's the you know that's the outlier. About seventy percent of the families that receive rapid rehousing mm -hmm. are able to remain stable after four months of assistance. Four months. Um, so so the best it's a best practice to utilize rapid rehousing as a resolution for homelessness. It's okay. meeting homelessness with housing. Um, and the, the research has shown that most people, if they are given the opportunity to get back into permanent housing quickly, have a greater likelihood of uh, becoming stable and remaining stable, reconnecting with jobs and with the community. Right. So, um, yeah, that's the goal. So just to wrap up, the, um, so the four months on, on an average that a family would stay, what uh, typically gets them back on track? Are there services offered to them during this time of, if it's any rehabilitation, mm -hmm. if it's uh, uh, monetary, if it's job? What, uh, what do we do within that four months 
outside of offering them a safe place to live. So uh, through the chair to Councilwoman Baker. So the family starts out in shelter, and the goal is that while they're in shelter, um, uh, shelter case management staff are assisting them to get their IDs, uh, to begin to look at you know, uh, income options, how to sustain themselves, uh, to uh, verify that they can get a utility turned on in their name, um, looking at uh, furniture options, so that when the family moves out of the shelter into their own unit in the community, um, they already have a start towards stability. At that point, uh, the rapid rehousing uh, program provides a, sort of a case management light approach, if you will, which is focused on uh, connecting the family or the individual with the community resources. With uh, Although this probably started while they were in shelter, for example, um, you know, what are the resources through JFS? You know, what are the job training or job placement uh, that's available? What income benefits would they be available for? Um, how do they get linked with the neighborhood collaborative? Um, you know, those kinds of community resources that once you're in the community, that's, right. you know, what we want to okay. do. So that is really the goal. Um, I know it was a wrap up, but let me, I'm just interested. Uh, once they move from the four months on the average in the rapid rehousing and they get into perhaps more permanent housing, is that the, the hopeful goal or end, or is there a continual um, progression that uh, we typically see when that person starts at the shelter, goes to rapid, moves on to housing, probably some other type of subsidy housing, and then permanent housing, I guess. When do we see the progression of that person uh, finally um, independent? Uh, through the chair to Councilman uh, Baker. So the really great thing about rapid rehousing is that it is permanent housing. So it's not a temporary housing. You know, the lease is in the family's name. Um, they don't. They don't move after four months. They they assume the payment of the rent. Um, they are essentially, you know, permanently stably housed. Okay, and so hopefully, you know, they will never return to homeless services. Um, again, as with the youth, if a family is getting to the third month, the fourth month, and uh, appears to not have the income, not generating the income to assume payment of the rent, then uh, our system has what we call progressive engagement, which means that, again, the family doesn't move, but we look to change the subsidy source to another funding stream. Um, uh, and extend their rapid rehousing. Um, and again, the best practice uh, research demonstrates that, you know, of the 30% of the families that are not able to be stable after four months, um, like about half of those families with additional assistance uh, achieve stability. And then again, uh, they are having case management during that extension. And if it appears that in fact, the family will need a permanent subsidy, then we look to identifying a source for a permanent subsidy. Right. Um, but, but, but the best thing about this is, is that the family's not moving from place to place. The family's in the community, the kids are in the schools, they're you know, able to connect with their church or their, you know, whatever their support systems are. Right. Thank you, I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a couple. Right. When, when, I, when asked how many times is a home inspection done, yes. um, you stated properties must be inspected prior to approving uh, for the unit for the R, uh, rapid rehousing subsidy. So I'm just wondering, um, 
if we're keep if we're subsidizing for four months, are we still in the process of inspect inspection of those properties, even though the subsidy has stopped? Uh, to, uh, to the chair, um, the inspection is done annually, if you will. So it would be when a family moves in. It would not be reinspected during the time they're in the unit, unless they were in that unit for a year, okay. and then it would be reinspected. Or if the tenant has a complaint and calls Eden and asks them to come out to to do an inspection if they feel that the unit is not um, being maintained. And these are physical inspections that are done by they're Eden trained, staff. Uh, trained. Well, they are Eden staff, but they're trained in what's called housing quality. Um, standards inspection, which is the federal standard. For example, it's the same standard that um, CMHA uses for the Section 8 program. There's a, I'm assuming a checkoff list yes. for that. Um, I don't know if they could provide that with me. We've had previous complaints of properties that have fallen substandard. Um, that may have happened through the course of the, the year. So how do we handle that? So you go out this year, the property's fine. You go back next year, something could have happened with the weather or whatever, tore the house up. It's not kind of amenable anymore, but the landlord's not moving and fixing it. How do we handle that in terms of the family? Do, are we moving them out? What, what, what is that safe or that that we do? do I, if it's okay, I'd like to ask Eden to come up because they sure. would be able to provide the detail that I think you're, you're looking for. Hello, uh, Elaine Gimble, Chief Operating Officer for Eden. So if somebody's in the unit um, for a year and we're doing an annual inspection, if there are items that fail that are life safety, the landlord gets a 24-hour time period to, re to repair those items. Um, if it's a non-emergency or non-life safety, they get up to 30 days, and then the inspector goes back to do a reinspection. If it doesn't meet those standards, then the tenant gets permission to move, and we have housing location services to help them find another unit but the landlord has to comply with what we say is wrong with the unit. Otherwise, um, we will terminate what we call a HAP contract. It's a housing assistance payments contract um, that we have with all the landlords that participate in our rental subsidy programs. Does that family remain in that unit until no, you No, if find they have another? a subsidy through Eden, they would move. Okay. So, but, but I with mean, the during the time, if the landlord hasn't fixed the property, are, we're not taking them back to the shelter. I'm just trying to... We're, we're allowing them... We're allowing them to find another unit to relocate. Okay. Yeah. But in that From, meantime, yeah. they're still housed in that previous... In that property. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so in terms of the landlord, are they, uh, since they did not comply, um, they're not used again, or they may have several properties... Uh, how, is, how is that handled? The majority of the time, the landlord makes the repairs, um, so it's rare that they don't, but in the, um, if they don't and they are um, have other properties, and if they're continuing to fail HQS inspections, then we will not use them any longer. Okay, and who takes those calls from the, um, the individuals that are staying in these subsidized places? So when they want to make a complaint on their landlord, they have not got a response from him or her who are they responding to at Eden? So um, each participant, depending on the program, has an eligibility specialist assigned to them. And so they would initially call um, that person and then um, they would have uh, contact with the inspector to come out and do an inspection of the unit. If they can't reach their eligibility specialist, there's always a supervisor or somebody else they can contact. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Uh, Gemmel or Director Gillette? All right, and number 10, you said to refer to Bob Math, so come on up, Bob. Uh, number 10 is uh, if there's only one bidder for the contract, in which case this, this is the case, um, how are they scored? Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Are you, do I need to read the question? Or are you familiar I, with I'm familiar with the question. All right, sir. Um, this, uh, they were the only respondent. We, you know, we issued, when we released the RFP, we released the, probably 25, 30 different organizations that do anything with in the housing arena. Um, Eden was the only one that responded. Um, under, you know, 
they're, they're, they, they crafted, a, their response is very well crafted. Um, it, it, met our, it met all the requirements, the expectations in the RFP. Um, if they didn't score well, um, we never award a contract or recommend to award a contract by default. Okay. Um, it's not the first time that uh, there have been situations in the past where we've issued RFPs, we've gotten you know, either one or two, you know, one or two responses, or sometimes multiple responses, but none of the respondents really, we felt comfortable making that recommendation. So what we've done in, in those situations like that, we've reissued the RFP. Okay. Um, in this case, we didn't think it was, it was necessary to reissue it. I think the response is very well crafted. And again, as Ruth and Director Gillette indicated, you know, they have a, a, a terrific track record in providing these services. Okay, so the answer was yes. Even though we have one yes. better, we still score. We, we still, still score. Go. We, they go through a review process like any other, regardless if there's one response or 21 responses. And how do you evaluate that? Um, we issue, in the, in the RFP, we put down all the areas that they have to respond to. You know, if there's obviously financial information, there's scope of work, there's qualifications of staff, there's locations, accessibility, equal access, uh, a number of areas. And the score sheet mirrors what we've asked them for in the RFP. So in each section is scored with X, X number of points are attributed to each section. You know? okay. So clearly the most important sections from, from our perspective are the scope and their ability to deliver the services. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, uh, I take it, uh, Mr. Math, you would like this second reading suspension? Or we have ample time. Is there, is there, there ample time? You know, to not go three you, reads. You, you, it, it starts January 1st, so it could, it could go to yeah. the 28th meeting and the 12th meeting. So it's potentially it could go all three readings should you desire. All right, let's, let's go outside the box. Second reading suspension. Can I have a motion for second reading suspension? Second. Mm -hmm. Second. I didn't motion. First and the first. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you both. Thank you very yeah, much. Right here. Thank you. Okay. Okay. If you could read the next item, Madam Clerk, into the record. Resolution number 2017-0221, authorizing an amendment to contract number CE1500310 with Maximus Human Services for the Work Experience Program for Work Required Public Assistance Recipients. Good afternoon, David Merriman, uh, Assistant Director of Health and Human Services, and I'm joined by Bob Math from our Contract Administration and Performance Unit. I think the next five items are from the uh, Division of job, uh, job and Family Services. And so uh, I'm, I'm figuring that Bob and I will stay up here for all five. Uh, Bob has much of the detail, but I thought I would introduce the item to start and be happy to take any questions. The first item, uh, Maximus Human Services. This is a contract that we've had and was bid uh, in 2015 for services that began in 2016, were provided through 2017, and we're uh, going to be uh, extending it for additional year and the additional amounts presented here. Maximus is a, a provider that uh, manages our work experience program, or WEP, as we like to refer to it. WEP is one of the core services that are provided to uh, assistance of cash and food assistance. And it places those individuals in work environments. The individuals do not get paid in, in doing the activity while they're at the work environment. Their time does count towards their receiving of uh, assistance. And uh, there are a number of, uh, of specifics as to how many hours a person spends there. Much of that is based upon what assistance they receive. And, uh, but suffice to say, this is a, a service that is valuable for us. It, it has a significant presence in our, in our community in that many of the individuals that receive cash and food assistance are placed in area businesses and nonprofits. They're there working alongside paid employees doing the core functions of, that, of those agencies and businesses. And uh, so they have both uh, the ability to gain their benefits and retain their benefits as well, support those organizations. Um, Bob, anything you'd add to this? Um, basically, the, you know, the purpose of this program, of the Work Experience Program, we've been in operating Work Experience Program for probably 15 years now, and you know, we competitively procure it every several years. Um, the, the main purpose of the Work Experience Program, those people that have a work requirement that are on public assistance, um, we refer individuals to this program that are, have really had little or no attachment to the labor force. 
So they're not ready to move into the world of work yet. They have to acquire some soft skills. Um, they can shadow folks on their job you know, at the work site. Um, so it really gives them that experience they need in order to put something on their resume. So you know, once they, it's, we call it a kind of a competency-based competency -based program. So once we see that after they've been on the work experience program for, say, a month, six weeks, you know, two months, and we see they're doing well, their attendance is there, their, their hygiene habits are, 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 you know, are fine, and then we refer them to one of our job placement programs. It's kind of a continuum of services. So that once they've acquired those skills, we move into a job placement program so that we can work with them to try to secure you know, permanent unsubsidized employment for them. Um, just to give you some sense of the scope and the breadth of the program, uh, they receive about 155 referrals every month um, to serve folks. Um, they, there's about, we have about, in the community, we have about 1,000 slots to place individuals. It represents about 400 different work sites. So the work sites, as, as Mr. Merriman indicated, are in government, you know, um, nonprofit organizations. Some for the folks on cash ins could be in, you know, um, in, in private companies, you know, where there's a, you know, potential, you know, to, to hire. Um, the average length of stay, somebody's in, in work experience program, it varies, but it's been about 30 days to 90 days. And then after that, they move on to, you know, either some kind of skilled training and or a job placement program to secure permanent employment. So is this a, um, the same as when the individual that's on assistance um, needs to work out in the community? This is the same. Yes, that's right. Type of thing. And who held the contract in previous years? Um, prior to Maximus, when we competitively procured, there was an organization called Rescare, um, who had that contract for two years. Then prior to that, it was uh, Goodwill Industries. Res, I didn't get Res it. Care, R E S C A R E. They're a, they're located. They're not a local affiliate, you know. Okay. Um, and then prior to that, just to give you a little history. It was it was operated by Goodwill Industries. And then for about five to ten years prior to that, it was implemented in house by the county. But the program grew so much, we just didn't have the staff to operate the program, and we decided to contract that service out. And do you know how uh, case managers assisted how many individuals in the 2016 year? In the 2016 year, I do have that. And these questions were sent um, before to, not kind of sure who to send things to anymore over there right now, but I sent it to Director Nichols. That's great. Oh, okay. By all means. I it to the right person. I saw the questions. Um, uh, they, in 2016, they served uh, a close but close to 1,500 participants. Okay. How many received employment or, since you stated it's kind of like a pre, how many were referred to job placement programs and, and, and retained out of that 1,500? Are we tracking that? Are we following? They're in this program, the pre, but then they get the soft skills and they go to the job placement program. Are we tracking how many successful individuals we have? Well, clearly... Um, Madam Chair, it's not Max's responsibility just to provide the work experience. Once they move out, once they move from the work experience to some, you know, another program, um, you know, that's one of the challenges we have as an organization to kind of track them across different programs. And we're working on some kind of integrated case management system to be able to track that. I mean, Maximus' responsibility is to provide the work experience. Once they achieve some competency, they, in, they inform their, you know, the, the individual's uh, worker, and the worker then makes another appropriate assignment. So to your point, it's a, it's a fair question. We don't have the, only anecdotally, we don't have the specific numbers of individuals. We're not there yet. So are they, are we asking in, uh, when we go out to bid that they provide the county with this information, who was successful and all that, so we can internally use, utilize it? Yeah, when next we go to bid, that's one of the key factors we'll be including in our contracts is how many individuals <laughs> received employment, how many individuals uh, received a wage advancement or got an education or training credential. Uh, to Bob's point, unfortunately, this is a, a, we're, we're at a point in a transition between data systems. I think we've talked about this on a few mm -hmm. occasions, but we, we moved our Medicaid programs to the state's new Ohio Benefit Worker Portal system. That transition began in 14, <coughs> continued through 15, wrapped up last year, in 2016. Unfortunately, the, um, the cash and the food assistance program continue to be managed out of the, the legacy system. It's called Chrissy, and uh, that's a, a nearly a 30-year-old DOS-based Cobalt system. 
it was <laughs> not designed to make the reports that you're that you're looking for. It's more designed to track whether or not uh, a person is doing the requisite activities to be able to be entitled to benefits. And so, you know, we we all recognize, as, as Bob stated, the need to probably collect better data. Our, our hope is that the OBW system, OBWP system will do that. We haven't seen the mock-up yet for how that system will, in fact, collect that data. The state is uh, in a pilot phase where they're beginning to test that uh, the new system with these programs, and we expect the, the transition to be completed next year. And so hopefully next year we'll have a better data system, we'll have better data, and we could we uh, be in a position to really answer questions like that. And why was there a difference of $2,648? and 96 cents uh, from the previous contract kind of dropped up a little. Uh, Madam Chair, I think there was there were some carryover dollars from the previous year that were unspent, so we just moved them into the, the new year. Uh, one thing I'd like to add, I think it's also very relevant, um, that uh, I think in terms of our contracting, I think in some respects we're kind of on the cutting edge, where this contract is a combination of cost reimbursement and performance-based, where actually some performance is linked to payments. Okay. Um, so if they don't achieve certain benchmarks, and in, in, in the work experience program, the benchmark is that, because, you know, we have this mandated federal requirement that a certain number of individuals, you know, 50% of our folks on the cash systems have to meet their required number of hours. Um, one of the benchmarks in their contract that's linked to actual payment is that 65% of the people that go to the WEP program have to meet or exceed the number of hours they're required to participate. If they don't, then there's a, there's a payment that they don't receive. So we don't want to put them at financial risk, but at the same token, we need, you know, there are payments linked to certain benchmarks, and we think it's kind of unique. It's one of, these, it's one of our contracts that's somewhat unique. I think looking at some of the background uh, information, it was about roughly, they were on average 70% uh, this organization. That's and, correct. And so that was uh, one of my questions, and I'm glad you answered. How can the performance benchmarks and performance outcomes be improved? And, and that's one that may have slipped by me. That is, this one, particular one was a performance base. Yes. Okay. Any questions? One. Councilwoman Baker. Um, just to be a little more familiar with the program, the $1.3 million, which is, uh, what I read here, was TANF dollars and um, two federal pots of money, right, that this is coming from. For $1.3 million, um, and it is a... 30, 60, 90 day program per person. So I just heard a little bit about the um, accountability piece of making sure that some criteria is met. But for that 1.3, is that, where does that money get spent? Who, what, Let me answer first. yeah, what, what do, how do they earn that in, um, as they oversee those individuals going through this program? Yeah, just uh, if I could start by one recognizing that. I think our goal is that most individuals stay 30, 60, 90 days. Some individuals stay longer than that. There's not a cap on the amount of time mm. that a person can spend there. Uh, there are, unfortunately, restrictions in the different activities that people do. So a person could leave there and go to a job training program. They can only stay in some of those programs for a short amount of times. And so on, in some cases, those individuals will come back. And okay. there'll, there'll be a kind of a, a cycling period. Okay. So uh, just so, so to be clear that, uh, you know, some individuals will stay there for months. Uh, and, and the entire time that they're there, they're being served by case managers from that organization that are checking in, seeing how they're doing, and really m monitoring the case, also looking for ways to upskill that individual to get them um, so that when they do leave that organization and they go to another job program, maybe they're then better able to be placed Okay. And um, last thing that I'd also like to add is that, so, uh, so this is primarily funded by TANF. We do have a little bit of SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program funding in this. And we also have uh, some of the Comprehensive Case Management Employment Program resources here. But the reality is that's TANF as well. So, but I, I wanted just, I wanted you sure. to be clear that this program serves uh, clients from three of our different systems, and in that way, they're they're able to serve people regardless of what program they come from. Uh, just as a follow up, how many do you have go through this system? Would you say in a year's time, like in 2018, the added funding for 1.3 million? How many will you serve 
that contain that one point three million or dollars that are what what type of yeah. volume are we looking at here? They they receive about one hundred and fifty referrals a month. You know? Now at any given time, um, there's probably two hundred. 200 to 225 folks that are active okay. so that they have to work with on a continual basis. So, you know, the, the 1.3 million is primarily all staffing. Okay. You know, I mean, that's, it's, it's a labor intensive program. Right. Thank you. Any other questions in regards to that? All right. Hearing none, um, I'd like to make a motion to move this to the full council second reading suspension. Is there a second? A second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, if you can read the next item into the record, please. Resolution number 2017-0222, authorizing a contract with United Way in the amount not to exceed $1,095,450 for emergency food purchases for the period 1-1-2018 through 12-31-2018. So, uh, next item, uh, again, David Merriman, Kyle Gajabin, I'm sorry, Department of Health and Human Services, here presenting a Kyle Gajabin family service contract. First, I want to recognize United Way was here two weeks ago. I think they did a full presentation on this contract, uh, very in, in detail and depth. So I'm not sure if we need to go too deep in, into the specifics of the contract. I think they did an outstanding job describing the service. And, uh, but this is, in fact, the county's annual contribution to address food insecurity in this community. This is money that's provided to United Way. United Way then uh, funnels those resources to the Cleveland Food Bank and ultimately through the Hunger Network into, uh, into homes and communities throughout uh, the county. Uh, Bob, I don't know if you'd add anything. Um, you know, Bob Math. You know, I think they did a, a very, you know, credible job when they presented several weeks ago. And clearly they tell the story. They, they can tell the story far better than us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this, the million dollars that the county contributes, you know, supports, you know, food purchase for 38 different hunger centers throughout the community. And United Way serves as a fiscal agent. And, and the, that out of the $1 million, $1.09 million that we give in this contract, a half of 1% goes to the administrative cost for United Way. It's like $5,000. The rest of it all goes directly into the purchase of food for the hunger centers. Okay, I just <clears throat> want to ask for just because I visited one of the sites yesterday, so I'm always hearing a different number. Sometimes I hear the 38, and then I hear the 33. Well, Madam Chair, there, there are 33, and then there's five associated inner ring, sub, uh, inner ring hunger centers that they awarded, kind of an, as an expansion grant. So it's 33 plus these five. They were part of what they call an expansion grant. But the the, the thirty three is the core services. Okay, you know. the five are new. We haven't yes. really dealt with them before. Okay, so just wanted to read some uh, data in that. And my question to uh, Hunger Network as well as Harvest for Hunger: How many pounds of food was distributed last contract cycle? So we could see that uh, the money is uh, we're getting the bang for the buck. And I'm not as good as our clerks with these numbers, so I'm just going to say 6.4. I'm not going to read that whole number out. Uh, and that's in the millions, pounds of food, in 2016. And for 2017, the first three quarters, um, they have provided 4.3 uh, million pounds of food. So just to give you an average of what, um, and that's for our 33 county-funded sites. They didn't include the five, five extra. Extension. So, uh, just and, wanna... uh, each quarter, the on the average, they, they serve about seventy-eight thousand to eighty thousand folks every quarter. So, so I just want some the, sense. The committee to know that um, that team of United Way, Hunger Network, and Har uh, Cleveland Food Bank has really done a great job extending and leveraging the funds, uh, and they have not increased since. We took office, so maybe I might look at that next year because going out to the sites, I do see the need, but we're doing a great job with what we have right now. So uh, any other further questions in regards to this contract? It is pretty self-explanatory as well as we had a presentation by them a couple weeks ago. So I'd like to make a mo motion to move this to the full council second reading suspension. Is second. there a second? It's moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Madam Clerk, if you could read the next item into the record, please. 
Resolution number 2017-0223, authorizing an amendment to contract number CE1500128 with Catholic Charities Corporation for Ohio Works First and Disability Financial Assistance recipients to extend the time period to 12-31-2018 and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $1,147,083.97. Okay, before we start talking about that, I do apologize. Something on the last one, it won't change the vote or anything, but we had some public comment related earlier in regards and response to 211. So, um, Dave uh, Merriman, if you could, 211, there's yeah. been a 20 minute delay on the response call. So, if you could just check with them uh, and get back with me if that is accurate. Uh, Madam Chair, we can. In fact, that contract for 211 is, will be coming up in front of, well, in front of the Board of Control within the next several weeks for the calendar of year 18. But we can bring that to the attention of United Way as well. Thank you. All right, proceed, please. Uh, David Merriman, Cuyahoga, uh, Cuyahoga County Department of Health and Human Services. We're presenting a contract for with Catholic Charities. And uh, this is a longstanding service that we've had where we provide case management to participants of several of our programs. Uh, we're joined today by Maureen D. from Catholic Charities. She's here, and so I appreciate uh, her, her, her participation. She's here to answer questions if there are any. Uh, we, are, uh, we are really excited about this program. This is something that we do locally that many other communities don't do. Uh, there are obligations that we provide, essentially eligibility case management when we are offering someone assistance. Uh, but what this service allows us to do is to provide uh, many of our participants true case management where, uh, you know, that, that uh, there's a, a, a professional that is there to help address the client's barriers to employment and to uh, participation in our programs. And that's, uh, that's something that is actually now a component of the Comprehensive Case Management Employment Program, but it's not a requirement across the board. And this is a, a, a priority that we've made locally, and we feel that our residents that have barriers to employment or barriers to uh, really taking advantage of our programs at times need additional assistance, and that's, that's what this provides. And so these case managers are there serving individuals, especially those that, uh, you know, there's some early indication may, in fact, uh, have a disability or possibly should be considering employment for disability assistance. And so a lot of these uh, case managers are in helping those individuals uh, really understand that process, supporting them while they're in the process, and ultimately, uh, you know, helping them to manage their life while they work those issues out. Bob, what would you add? Uh, Madam Chair, just uh, in the committee, um, just a little, just a little history. Um, there, this is actually sort of two, there are kind of two streams in this, in this program, uh, both of them very much interrelated. When we first crafted, it was something called intensive case management. Um, we crafted that because we recognized that a number of years ago, and I think we were, we were very unique in this. I think we were the only county that was doing this program initially. We recognized that folks were, being, were coming to the agency and applying for benefits, you know, who needed to be involved in activity. So initially, it would refer them to an activity, not recognizing that they had, they had significant barriers you know, mental health, substance abuse, domestic violence, homelessness. And we're referring to programs knowing that the likelihood of them being successful in this program without these other, these other challenges being mitigated were slim and none. So we crafted this program called Intensive Case Management. So once we identify these folks before we refer them to an activity, we recognize they have some significant barriers. I'm not talking about child care or transportation. Those we can resolve relatively easy. But these other significant barriers, what we did, we, 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 we competitively procured this and we awarded a contract to Catholic Charities and their staff are all licensed clinicians. So what they do, they do this assessment, and, and, they link, and, they, and they identify what the barriers are, and they link them to community resources. And then once, you know, uh, and, they, and th those that are applying for SSI, that process is a very lengthy process. They help, navigate, they help navigate that system on behalf of the individual. So what happens, they get involved, and once they either resolve the issue or mitigate them, and then they go back, and they refer the person back to their, their employment, their specialist here at the county, and then they'll refer them to an appropriate program. But if we refer them without dealing with these issues, there, there's no success. So that's how it was crafted. Then when the Comprehensive Case Management Employment Program was, was launched in 2016, one of the requirements of that program that was mandated by the state is we had to provide these folks long-term case management. 
So he thought it was just logical that we um, extend the contract with Catholic Charities, amend that with CCMEP dollars, and let them continue to do this case management because they already had a relationship with many of the customers, and they could stay involved with the, you know, with, with these folks through the CCMEP program. So that's kind of how these two systems kind of merge these, and you know, and the similarities. Okay. All right. I'd like to. Um Welcome, Maureen D. for coming out this afternoon. I'm going to open it up for questions for the committee. Hearing none, um, Bob, you answered my uh, first question. Uh, my second one, just a, get basically a statement. I visited this intensive case management uh, system in the past. Uh, can you remind me what the procedure is uh, for the clients that are still in the system? It was years ago that I went. Or is it designed for That's new easy. client caseloads only? Uh, so it depends on a uh, couple conditions, and so okay. uh, I, I should recognize that the Comprehensive Case Management Employment Program that Bob referenced, or CCMEP as it's commonly referred to, is for cash assistant recipients that are 18 to 24. It, it, that program can serve someone that's younger than 18, but the case management component is, is really targeted to individuals that are parents as opposed to children. And so uh, once an individual comes into CCMEP and they're, again, 18 to 24 and they're on cash assistance, that uh, the case management stays with them. In fact, it stays with them beyond the period that they're even eligible for services. It continues to track and follow up with them, even if they leave the program because they get a job. And, and so in that way, there's a, a little bit more of a tail or an extension on the contract. For individuals that are, are not 18 to 24 or are not in that CCMEP program, this is principally providing case management while they are a client. And I don't know if that's, if anything else you'd add on that. Uh, just to give you some kind of breadth of the program, for the intensive case management, you know, those individuals are identified initially with some significant barriers. They get about 15 referrals a month. And again, these are all licensed cl you know, clinicians that work with these folks, um, li or licensed social workers. For the CCMEP program, for that long-term case management, they, they get about 55 referrals a month. And under, under the, the mandate under CCMEP that's by the state, we have to maintain case management service for up to 12 months. So you can see that the, how these caseloads, they increase as every, we don't exit them as fast as they enter. And, and do they utilize the uh, back area, the workforce? component dress for success and all that that you've implemented in the yeah, yes they do they are they are they are the case managers that one are located there and and so as you look at the uh, the legislative agenda in front of you today Maximus is sitting in half of the cubicles Catholic Charities is sitting in the other half and they're basically looking across the the partition at each other serving the same clients frequently supporting each each other and really supporting a more integrated uh, focus. They also are able to refer clients to Ohio Means Jobs, which is located in that building in that same center. And so are, they are, in fact, working together. And, uh, you know, it's something that we think can continue to grow and improve. And we're, we're, we'll be talking in 2018 about some other enhancements in that service. Okay. And that was one of my final questions. What were the similarities or differences between Maximus and the Catholic Charities? Mm -hmm. Because reading the description, they kind of do the same thing. So all the Maximus is located there, or are they located somewhere else as well? Maximus is located, that their staff are located there in the Work Opportunity Resource Center. The Catholic Charity staff are located in JFS. Okay. They, they're in that room, but they're also in the other previous. There, there's a couple other rooms on that floor. And the reason we do that is when we're doing these assessments, we're asking some really sensitive information. We want to give that, that, that social worker or that counselor time to close the door and really ask a client about, you know, if they've checked a box that says they've had family violence, tell us more about that. So n not every uh, component of the Catholic Charities work occurs in the Work Opportunity Resource Center cubes, but they all occur in that, in that, that wing of the building and they're all using services together. Okay, and can you explain this like a general question, I guess, over all the contracts? Explain what the county's oversight is for these independent organizations that receive these type of contracts. Mm -hmm. Now, I know with these two, they're right there, um, but if you could answer that. Um, Madam Chair, with all our contracts, you know, we have a fairly robust monitoring and evaluation uh, system in place. 
Um, every one of our contracts required to provide monthly reports to us, as well as quarterly reports, as well as year-end reports. In addition to that, um, we do we send our staff out. We do observations. Um, we want to see what we're what we're getting. We do. We also do case file reviews once or twice during the year, where we where we take a a statistically significant sample of the files and review them to make sure. So if it's if they're supposed to have an assessment tool involved, they have to have a resume in there. We make sure that everything's been done. It's in the file. So we have it, and then we follow up with you know with correspondence to the provider, make them aware of. I mean, these are our partners, so we want them to do well. But we want to make sure that they're we want to make sure they're in compliance with the contract. But more importantly, we want to make sure they're providing quality services. So when we observe them and we do the case file review, it's really it's really looking at quality. That's number that's the most important aspect to us, for us. Any other questions from committee? <clears throat> All right. Uh, da, da, this is one that's been extended as well, so I suppose you would like second reading suspension? Uh, Madam Chair, on, on all of these, we do have time if you want to have them heard three times. Uh, it's, you know, it's something for, uh, you know, we, we can handle three readings, but your call. All right, I'd like to make a motion to move R2017-0223, second reading suspension to the full council. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, read the next item into the record, please. Resolution number 2017-0224, authorizing an amendment to contract number CE160090 with the Centers for Families and Children to extend the time period to 12-31-2018 and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $1,122,454.58. David Merriman, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, this contract has actually several service components. And uh, so I'd also, I'd like to one, recognize that the Centers for Families and Children has been a long time provider of a job readiness, job search, uh, job placement service. Uh, there was also an additional service that they began during this term, which is called the Job Skill Center. I'll speak to both services, but uh, there's, there's, this is a contract that has really two service components. But we'll be talking about the job search, job readiness, job placement con service as well with the next contract. So some of what we say in this for that JR, J JS, contract uh, is a, it's a service provided by both of these providers. So the Centers for Families and Children and the El Barrio program uh, manage what, uh, what we have developed as a job, uh, job skill center. And this is essentially an onboarding service so that when a person comes to us and requests cash assistance, before they start the program, they go through uh, a series of classes, courses, and some, some instruction as to what are the expectations for service participation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there, there are real significant laws that relate to individuals receiving cash assistance, and uh, you know, such as the work, work hours and you know, reporting of hours, and there's good cause when you don't get the right amount of hours. And what we found works well for us is to really take the time to make sure that those participants they, they understand the, the they understand those rules and those laws, but also begin to be uh, exposed to what a work week looks like for them. So all of our participants before beginning cash assistance, they go through this job skill center. They start to uh, they 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 are there for the number of hours that they'll be required to do activities moving forward. Uh, when they don't show up or they don't complete, they actually don't go on cash assistance. At that point, we feel like you know, maybe they're not ready or there's something going on and we want to help them address it. And so b before they start their clock and receiving cash assistance, they, they have a very clear understanding of what the expectations will be. Uh, the other thing that happens is when they start with the centers or El Barrio, they begin to actually be exposed to work opportunities. There's other job placement and, and, and other services available. And so, uh, and sometimes people will start with uh, an, a benefits application and then a job offer will come through and they don't in fact, really need, in fact need the benefits. So they may drop out voluntarily. All of our participants before going on to cash assistance start in this program, they're referred there. And so that, after they've completed this orientation, they then come back to job and family service. We, we develop a, a plan with them. It's uh, uh, essentially a, a case plan to get them employment 
And some of the individuals may get referred back to the centers because we want them, really as Bob had talked about with the work experience program, if it looks like they have past work experience, if it looks like they have the skills or the education, they may need help just finding a job. So they may get referred back to the centers and the centers has, uh, they operate a, essentially a, a, a series of training programs that can help expose a person to another career, uh, could give them specific training and, and then they place them. Uh, and uh, or, or there may be someone that may not have worked, but they're a high school graduate. They don't have any real clear barriers to employment. They may go straight from the job skill program to the El Barrios or the, the center's job readiness, job search program. Let me say just a few more things about the, the job search, job, job readiness, job search program. Uh, the centers works with a no, they work with a number of local businesses, CVS, Starbucks, um, I, I think uh, they've, they've had some past interaction with hospitals, and, uh, and they have their own pharmacy. Uh, the centers operate a pharmacy as well. And so one of the things that they do is they are beginning to train our participants, or not beginning, they train our participants for actual jobs, jobs that are in their pharmacy, jobs that are in CVS's pharmacies, placements in, um, in Starbucks, and uh, we, we kind of have, st have really recognized that each of those placements can be an important first step. Uh, frequently, they're not, they're not jobs that are, are hopefully the person will be staying at forever. And so we're really beginning to talk with, with the centers and we're wanting to better understand how if they receive a referral and they do a training for a person to be a pharmacy tech and then they place them at CVS or they place them at their own pharmacy, how do they retain them so that they can then get them the next level of certification to then get them a job at a UH or get them a job at Metro or the clinic and get them into a system that then has a lot of education and real career growth. So I, I, we're really excited about this contract and relationship because, you know, it, it does, in fact, help us maintain compliance. That's a requirement. But more importantly, it helps us place people in jobs that are, uh, that are needed in demand right now. And uh, i got to say one last thing about this. The, the centers regularly has uh, job fairs. And we, uh, I think this was captured over the Veterans Day weekend that we started to, I'm sorry, Labor Day weekend, we started to, to pull together the job fairs that all of our providers are doing. We now post them on the county website. And the centers has really been a leader on this because they, th their job fairs, they're now inviting not just our clients assigned to them, but clients from other agencies. They're opening their doors and they've been having clients that aren't even JFS clients, but are clients of say, Ohio Guidestone or clients of other aligned organizations come in and look at a job opportunity. And you know, what I like about that is that that's a type of collaboration that really puts the client's interest forward and recognizes that, you know, one, the business wants to hire somebody quality. They don't necessarily care where they came from. And they have openings right now. And the centers are really helping connect people with skills, people with employment needs to businesses that want employees. And I think they're doing a great job with it. Bob, would you add anything? Uh, hey, Madam Chair, the only thing I'd add, um, for, for this contract, along with the ones coming up with this Verge that do our job placement activities, um, those, those, these contracts are also a combination of cost reimbursement and performance base. Mm -hmm. So the performance base portion is based upon the number of people get a job, number of people retain their job for 90 days or 180 days. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do is we use a percentage because they don't, they don't recruit their customers. All their customers are coming from JFS, you know, folks on cash assistance. So what we do is we use a percentage. You know, so the number of people that sh you know, show up the program, we expect 70% to complete. We expect 70% of those to become employed, 65% to, you know, to retain their jobs. Uh, so, there are, so there are benchmarks, and there actually there's a payment link to that. So for everybody that secures a job, we pay them, I don't have the dollar amount right in front of me, like $1,000. If they retain the job, we pay them $1,200, something like that. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's one of these unique programs that it gives them an opportunity to earn their dollars, um, but we take we kind of take the edge off it because about seventy about sixty five to seventy percent of the contract is cost reimbursement. That's actual expenses because these are all nonprofit organizations. We surely don't want to see them lose money to serve our customers because they, they, again they're not out recruiting these folks. They're dependent upon us referring those individuals. So we base it on percentage, and our and our bar is fairly high. We look at what's you know comparable jurisdictions 
economic, the economic environment, and our benchmark for the number of individuals that we expect to be placed and retain our jobs is probably a little higher than most other comparable jurisdictions. But that's something we sh every year we surely don't want to lower our expectations. And they've done a very credible job. I mean, the number of placements, this last quarter of the year is when a lot of the placements really happen. You know? So when we, when we see their year-end statistics, traditionally they've always met their benchmarks, both this provider and the provider that's coming up on the agenda as well. I have about three questions. Uh, remind this committee what FAET stands for again. Yes. Food Assistance Education and Training. I really do apologize. There are I'll a lot of acronyms. I'll probably ask again. Food, assist no, food that Assistance won't stick in my head. Employment and Training. Thank you. So Food Assistance is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. So Food Assistance and SNAP generally get, refer get uh, commonly used. It's food stamps. And so there's a component of the Food Assistance Program that uh, individuals receiving food assistance in certain conditions have to do work activities in the same way that a person receiving cash assistance has to. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there are many more individuals that receive that assistance, that receive food assistance and cash assistance, and the dollars are significantly less to support those food assistance individuals. And so we try to leverage contracts. We bring services together. And, you know, we, these providers can only serve the people that are eligible for the service. But we, we hope that by bringing together the food assistance and the TANF programs and having them in a contract, you can support enough of the organization that, you know, hopefully they can serve more of the food assistance people, although there's not nearly the same amount of resources. Okay, this contract was funded in 2016, 525000 2017, 561 and some change. And in 2018, a big jump to $1.1 million. Uh, why the difference in funding amounts? And how many uh, are served in, in each contract year? And if you don't have that data, you can get back to me. But why the difference in funding amounts for these? And, and, excuse me, Madam Chair. Initially, these are two separate contracts. And then this, this last year, we merged, we merged two of them. See, in the past, we've probably, by merging the two, con there was one for the Job Skills Center that we started in mid-year because the state mandated that for us to provide that service. Uh, so that, that was like, you know, a $750,000 contract. And then their job placement contract was, you know, another five hundred seven hundred thousand dollars um, when we when we mended it, we decided to kind of was the activities were so similar, we decided to merge them into two. So so that that's the jump. But we, when we merged them, we probably saved seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in TANF dollars that we could use for other programs. You know. Yeah. And in terms of the numbers, refer you know, um, you know to you know to you know in the last twelve months, you know. Uh, they served about 400 referrals that have come into door. Yeah. Okay. Just to give you some sense of the of other numbers. And what set the centers apart from other vendors? Uh, this was one of those that there was about four or five vendors. Um, so were the scores, and also my second part of that question, were the scores different on each bidding session? So was, I think it was about five different um, organizations that bid for this contract. The centers won, but uh, so I'm just wondering when that bidding process happens, are we scoring them uh, by different teams or? Uh, Madam Chair, the way we do our review process, um, I, th I think we really do our due diligence. Um, these RFPs were issued initially were issued in, in for, two th for the 2016 program year, so this is a, a second amendment. Um, when we when we receive responses. Um, we have multiple, you know, e we have each review team has roughly about four reviewers and there's a team lead. But then what I also do is I have multiple teams reading the same proposals. So when everything's all said and done, we have a lot of folks reading them. We score them, then we, can, we take a look at the scores, then we rank them. Okay. And these were, the, you know, at one point, just to give you a little history, at one point we had probably 11 providers providing the same service. Because as the numbers, mm -hmm. as, as numbers of folks on, that were, had a work requirement, as that, as that number reduced, we surely didn't need as many providers. And these are the these are the top two scored providers when we issued that RFP two years ago. Okay. Any other questions? Chair, I do. Councilwoman Baker. Uh, I know that I may be asking something that was in 0223, but there's a common thread through all of these. So I'll, I'll just ask. The barriers that we talk about um, what needs to be overcome before we can get someone really into the track of job placement um, and 
getting the quality of life that we all want them to have is um, what would you say is probably your most common, maybe not your top barrier, because it could be mental illness or drug addiction or different things like that. But I, I guess when we talk about higher education and higher skills and getting people into a job that could be sustainable for them, how many do you have that we need to finish high school? How many do we have that uh, need that GED requirement that really stops them in their tracks, even though they may have everything else going for them? You know, through the chair, you know, Councilman Baker, um, about 15, the national statistics say about 15 to 20 percent of folks on cash systems have mental health issues or alcohol or the drug issues. You know, we've seen a little lower percentage here in, in Cuyahoga County, um, but that's what kind of the national standards, you know, the, the, the measurements indicate. Of the folks that come, about 40% lack a high school degree or GED. Okay. So that clearly, it's a, you know, it precludes them from participating in a lot of training programs because a lot of training programs require a high school degree, a GED, or being able to demonstrate you can read at the eighth grade reading level. Right. So their struggle. So those are, you know, um, those are probably the, the two most, you know, for folks on cash assistance, we deal with a lot of younger mm -hmm. single-headed households, females, um, who've had little work history at all. You know, so those are the candidates that, as we talked about earlier, we'd refer to the work experience program. They haven't had any attachment to the labor force. They really don't, haven't developed that work ethic yet. So those are probably the most significant barriers that we've seen. Yeah, let me just add to that. So uh, we know that for the food assistance program or SNAP of 18 to 60 year olds, approximately 55,000 out of 100 or so thousand don't have a GED. A little more than half of the food assistance program. Now that program goes, that's, that's probably a la larger age range than Bob's referring to. I think right. cash assistance is much more focused on young families, frankly, because Ohio limits the number of months a family can get nationally. A family can get food, can get cash assistance for 60 months. Ohio has made the decision that families can only get it for 36 months unless there's a hardship. So we have restricted beyond the federal requirement, and as a result, families tend to exhaust their benefits or younger. Uh, for food assistance, there, that restriction does not exist. And in fact, as people age, they, they don't have the same, the same amount of requirements on them. So probably there are more people in, on food stamps that don't have a GED and are probably uh, going to continue to stay on food assistance for the remainder of their life. Um, and, but, you know, so, so of 109,000, 55,000 don't have a GED, 53,000 say that they do. But I think it's important to recognize as a barrier, even though a person may have a GED or a high school diploma, they may lack the literacy skills or the numeracy skills to actually be uh, in, a, in a quality job, in a job that pays a livable wage. And so um, I, I, I'd have to say the true answer to this question, I don't know that there's a top barrier. I think it's really the interplay of barriers that's really significant. It is the mental health and substance abuse, but it's a lot of it is the, the literacy, the, the numeracy, the lack of education. And that's really where we're going, especially with our relationship with the libraries moving forward. Right. Thank you for that, if, if I may. Um, it would just seem to me that, uh, you know, there are certain barriers that people can overcome, but when it comes to their education and their GED, they're, they're stopped right at the door. And even if they have that GED but don't have the skills, yeah. at least they have the GED to, to open that door to hopefully give them the resources they need to, to move further. But I guess I would ask, you know, is there an emphasis on that 40%, I think I heard, yeah. or maybe even as high as 55% to the <clears throat> program of what we're doing to help those achieve, which could be a long-term, you don't get a GED overnight. Right. Um, to, so, yeah, to sustain those that are in need of trying to achieve it. Yeah, it's a tough situation. First, I, I should recognize the state has recently changed policies. So GED the, is, is one specific branded uh, educational equivalency that's out there. Right. Uh, the state has recently expanded and added two others, high set and I think task is the third. Yeah. So now there are three different types of testing that a person can do, and each has... Uh, a little bit of a, a, a focus and, and a different focus. But we hope by having more options available, people that have found that the GED process isn't for them have other options. 
And so I, I first would say that, and, and I really hope that that change will help more people in Ohio get through the high school equivalency process and complete their test. Um, so I have to just admit this, and so a, fam a person coming in to receive cash assistance and um, needing a GED can't go and just take GED classes and have that meet their hours. I see. Is, are the other two programs you mentioned from the state, do employers recognize that? And does that open the door to higher level skill training? So, uh, you know, I, I, I think they're new. I think the change has occurred really in the past month. So I'm not sure that they would recognize the names right now, but really the person's issued a high school equivalency certificate. Okay. So it may not say GED on it, but we'll say it, it's endorsed by the Board of Regents or the Ohio Department of Education, I forget which. Good. And, um, but you know, so, but I, I also have to admit that we tend to continue to make this a policy issue for Cuyahoga County, and we keep telling the state, if you want us to help more people get a GED, then you should count the GED as the activity they have to do for benefits. Because right now, as it stands, a person coming in that doesn't have a GED and doesn't look like they have the work skills to go and get a good job, right. we send them to WEP. And, and they have to do that work experience program, even though we know we want them to get a GED. Now, we'll refer them for a GED, and they can get some makeup hours to that. Principally, they meet their hours through that work experience program. Nice. And we keep saying to the state, why don't you just make GED the program, the only program? Let's double down on that and make that a priority. Right. I like that. I agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, on, the, on that point, mm -hmm. the county offers these three types of testing? So uh, the county does not. The county is not one of the providers. I'm going to use some, some acronyms here. I apologize. But the Adult Basic Education and Literacy or uh, ABLE program has recently changed its, its brand, if you will, in the state. It's now called Aspire. So the state dropped the term ABLE and is now called Aspire. And the state has four Aspire providers in Cuyahoga County. They are uh, tri -C, Polaris, Seeds of Literacy, and uh, Parma ABLE. Well, and, and, and the reality is Parma ABLE is actually the, the county library system. Uh, Cuyahoga County Library System is the fiscal agent for that, that organization and really has integrated it in. So it really is the County Library, Tri-C, Seeds of Literacy, and Polaris. They're the providers. They offer free testing preparation services throughout Cuyahoga County. The County Library has really focused its relationship on the city of Cleveland, and so they have a strong relationship with Felton Thomas and the Cleveland Public Library, and they provide quite a few court courses throughout the city. They also then have relationships with nonprofits throughout. All of those providers do. And so services are being provided throughout the county for free. There is a cost for the test, but there are also scholarships that help reduce that cost. Um, and forgot to ask earlier, RFP formal. I could have asked in any of the uh, <clears throat> contracts, but... Please remind me what the RFP formal is. So all of these were formal RFPs. We okay. issued an RFP, and um, these were the these were all competitively bid. Okay, I've never seen that word formal put behind the RFP. There's an informal RFP process for contracts less okay. than twenty five thousand. You can see, you can seek three <clears throat> quotes and move to the board of control. But it, for something over twenty five thousand, we issue an RFP. We post it. We give a deadline unless we re request a, an RFP exemption. All right. Any other further questions from the committee for this contract? All right. Hearing none, I'd uh, like to make a motion to move this to the full council. Second reading suspension. Is there a second? All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, Madam Clerk, if you can read the last one okay. into the record, please. Resolution number 2017-0225, authorizing an amendment to contract number CE1600091-01 with Verge Incorporated for job readiness, job search, job placement, and job retention services for Ohio Works First cash assistance and food stamp recipients for the period 7-1-2016 to 12-31-2017 to extend the time period to 12-31-2018 and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $700,000. David Merriman, Department of Health and Human Services. This is uh, the same service that we talked about in the above item. This is the job readiness, job search. Uh, they, uh, Verge has uh, different relationships with different employers, and so they may not have the same relationship with 
uh, CVS or, or, or Starbucks, but they may have a relationship with area restaurants and, and retail establishments and other businesses. This was pro competitively procured on the same timeline, and as Bob referenced, this was one of the top two scores. I think uh, with the exception of the Jobs, Job Skills Center, everything else that we said about um, uh, about the above item, you could say about this in terms of the process and the way that they help people address their barriers and get them placed. Same thing can also be said of the performance-based contracting being used in addition to the, the standard contracting structure. Is this the same as El Barrio? This is not. Uh, this used to be referred to as l &E and Associates. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a separate, completely separate provider. Okay, I only have one question, <clears throat> and it's kind of <clears throat> tied into the previous contract, uh, 0224. Um, during the combat for Verge and um, I guess it was with the Centers for Families and Children, that one when it had four, four or five uh, going for the bidding process, the um, just didn't understand something, the IG ethics registration boxes, uh, under the CPVF, it's, it's kind of like the breakdown of the contracts. All of them were marked um, okay, but this this particular one was marked uh, no. Uh, so just want to understand what that difference was. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I I do know that this is a registered vendor, Bob. I don't know if you know kind of what the IG status was. I don't. Uh, we wouldn't have probably gotten this step if at this point this is the second year of this contract you know so when we initially recommended them and they were awarded a contract um, all those you know the inspector general's registration all had to be in place so maybe on the original tab sheet maybe they didn't go back and you know and that was for diversity. for um, the last contract but they're doing similar things right yes, yes. okay so uh, any other questions in regards to that just trying to see councilwoman brown so is this the, is Verge, you said it was formerly known as L and E? L and E, it's the letters L, N, and E. That's, uh, I think, the initials of the, who was a proprietor of the, of the business at the time. They've incorporated as a nonprofit. It's Lisa Evans. Okay. And, um, and now it's Verge. That's correct. Okay. So you indicated we kind of did uh, reference the previous contract. How, how long have we been with Verge? Is this new as of? This particular no. agreement. Um, through the chair, uh, Councilman Brown, this is the this is the first amendment of this contract. So this is the second year um, when when Eleni was when Eleni was doing business with us. Um, there was one year we didn't contract them. There was again we went through a competitive procurement process, and there were other entities that came with a more compelling response. When they bid on this last RFP, they wrote a, you know they crafted a you know a, a good response. They had a good track record. And we recommended them to to get to kind of get back in the fold and do bit and work with us. Their performance measures traditionally have been extremely high. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, no further uh, questions. Concerning this legislation, I'd like to make a motion to move this to the full council. Second reading suspension. Is there a second? Second. second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, thank you, gentlemen. A lot <laughs> of legislation. And you said, Mr. Maff, we have what? Coming our way, HHS committee. You said there was a contract coming. Okay. You got to say all that again. Um, there, yeah, Madam Chair, we have several large contracts that are expected to come before you soon. One is with our under DCI, under D Division of Children and Family Services, that are out of home care contracts, which is really the backbone of DCFS. It's all the residential and foster care. You know, it's it's a you know it's forty million dollar allocation. Um, then we also have one coming forward with our Department of Senior Adult Services for options for independent living, which is several millions of dollars. And then another one with uh, Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries Association for the for also for Department of Senior Adult Services for the adult guardianship. So those are, will all be coming from, you know, in front of you, you know, very soon. As well as some additional contracts from the Office of Homeless Services that I think you're aware of. Okay. Oh, get ready, committee. So you need those passed out before the end of the year? Yes. All right. All right. Sir. And they've actually, they've all been, they're in the queue. They've, I mean, we've allowed ample time. There are a couple, unfortunately, there are a couple delays 
that prevent us, you know, that we're hoping to introduce them to council within the, in the next two meetings. Whether we'll, we'll get the third reading is, is will be tough. Um, so give you just an example with the board and care contracts, there's, it's a master contract. So there's 40 some odd providers. So if, if two providers are delinquent in terms of sending their assigned contract back, it, it holds up. We were ready to present that about three weeks ago. But there are two providers that were just delinquent sending this, they're signing the contract and sending it back. So it literally delayed the whole process. But everything's been in the queue and just waiting to move forward with it. Thank you. Uh, miscellaneous business, I would like to mention St. Paul AME Distribution Center for Food is a new location assisting with need. It is out uh, at 4118 Brookside Avenue. It's the Puritus area, Councilman Miller's area. And uh, we have a site visit planned Friday at 115 if you'd like to join. Uh, any other public comment related to agenda? Yes, we're up in Pinking Butts. <clears throat> This has been a very extensive meeting, and I wanted to comment on some of the things I did hear from this table. I don't know what happens when people sit in that chair that you're in, but people like to insult me, and I really didn't, I really didn't like that. I don't ever give you anything that's inaccurate. I never give you inaccurate information. And your questions in terms of eating and some of the other questions you have, I do have answers. I have been a probation officer doing pre-sentencing for Cleveland Municipal Court, so I've been on both sides of the desk. And I wanted to just say anything, with, and I'm not trying to pick a fight with anybody, but I, I do say, I don't know the gentleman's name who was just up here with Mr. Merriman, our words matter. And to assume that people who are unemployed have competency issues that needs to be corrected, please. Because we who are um, overcomers and who are victims of domestic violence, it's not that we're unemployed because we're incompetent or that we're mentally ill. We just have missed some challenges in life. And I, I would like for you to even take the time, sir, meaning no disrespect to you, but I would like for you to just con consider your words because it's not a matter of competence and incompetence all the time. And I did want to let you know that the Centers for Family and Children does not do what you said, and you may want to look in your books at that because they don't even offer those options when you go there. They send you straight to the mental health piece. They don't do anything for you other than that. Um, so I wanted to tell you that. And I, I came this afternoon because I am the uh, founder of Global Engagement Dissolving Violence Against Women and Children, as well as some other entities, and I'm the clergy for Black on Black Crime Incorporated. And when I came in here to the meeting Tuesday, I stated to you that my grandchildren are missing. I still don't know where they are. I've seen pictures, but I don't know where my grandchildren are, and I filed for custody of them on July the 7th of this year, and I'm very bothered by that. And I've been trying to reach, Madam uh, Chairperson, I've been trying to reach Director Wisekittle from the Department of Children and Family Services who will not return one call to me and will not meet with me. And many things have happened since then. Cases have been opened and involved, and the Department of Children and Family Services had caseworkers and Cleveland law enforcement officers actually say for me not to know where my grandchildren are. Um, after asking me to take care of them and then told me that they didn't care if my daughter was homeless the rest of her life, they would never give me anything for those babies. And I don't know where they are to this day. And I speak as a woman, a mom, a grandmother, an individual who has been fighting for my rights in my life, all of it. And I think that's very insulting and it's very horrible to do that to those babies for the person who's been taking care of them ever since they've been born and helping my daughter. And I, uh, Chairwoman and Council uh, members, I've come before you today because domestic violence is very, very real. And I don't know if you know the impact of what you do through Health and Human Services, but I'm still experiencing some of the after, uh, I'm still experiencing some of the effect of it. And I ask you to have your people who come to these desks to speak with me. They won't return my calls, David Merriman, Cynthia Wise Kittle, help. nobody returns any of my calls. And then when you come here and you get these presentations, you're not getting accurate information. Even when um, the CEO from Eden was here, that wasn't fully accurate information. And they, people need to talk. We need to communicate with one another. When I'm willing to come forth, because you have billions of dollars spent on if you see something, say something. If you're being abused, tell. And when I do, 
then I'm portrayed as a liar, but I operate on both sides of the desk. And I, I ask you, um, uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Conwell, I have brought some things to share with you all, but my time has run out on the clock. But I want you all to remember this uh, that's coming up on the 21st in the United States, uh, the district court about the police um, and Office of Professional Standards and police. Because as you address Health and Human Services Affairs, that, that's in, impacted by that. I fell through the cracks as a result of reporting domestic violence, lost my job and everything, and it's not because I'm incompetent or I'm mentally ill. And I do have opportunities available. Can you give that, a copy of that to the clerk? So sure, I'm going to give it to you. And I also have opportunities available, uh, sir, through what I do. I'm a licensed ordained pastor as well as other things, an entrepreneur. That will, I would be glad to work with you and help you get the people some help. Thank you so much, and God bless you. You're welcome. Uh, just a final statement before we adjourn. My intentions is never to harm, only to help. So if I hear something in public comment, and I know the directors are here, I try to restate that so it can be addressed and answered, or the information can be found, because we are all very busy, and so I try to utilize time management and get it right then and there so it can be answered instead of having to go back to my computer and retype something. So my apologies if it was misunderstood, but that's kind of how I, I roll and I do things. Any other comments from the committee? All right, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>